Hi, this is James Stoke. I'm host of Webcomics Reviews and Interviews. Today, we're going to talk webcomic art basics. So sit back, relax, and let the Geek Fest be in. I know it sounds pretty obviously that everybody reads comics, but a lot of us tend to forget that there's actually neat little um, conventions that may not be a bad thing to look at. Um, obviously, before we get going, I'm going to heavily recommend that you read Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics. Again, you're going to hear that book mentioned quite a lot in this podcast. If you haven't gotten a copy by now, you really should. It's a great read, and it's going to simplify a lot of this conversation. That said, a lot of you are going to find this conversation to be pretty much basic. Irritating and... Yeah. So, go ahead. We're going to be talking extreme basics here. If you don't want to hear that like for the zillionth time, hey, uh, go ahead and go elsewhere. We're really not going to be talking a lot more than what you already know. We're just going to talk extreme basic conventions. Or if that's really useful every so often. You know, it's one of those dreaded, yeah. Everybody's at different levels and everybody gets tired of hearing about it. On the other hand, if you're a beginner, stick close and we'll discuss all the little details you know in order to do the art for your webcomic. Except, of course, actually how to do it. So, let's start off basics. Panels. If you're going to be doing a single panel webcomic, great. Keep in mind that you're pretty much limited to one action, a couple of lines of dialogue, and that's it. You're going to have to get in, take care of it really quick, and get out. The three to four panel, you've got a little bit more stuff to play around with. So have fun with it, but keep in mind that you... If you really want to have some fun with it, set it up on a weekly basis. That is, you've got three or four strips that you're releasing over a week's time that have a common actual arc. It's actually, you know, the standard, we're going to set up a problem, deal with the problem for a couple of days, and then solve it. And go on to the next arc the next week. Obviously, you can also set this up for us during an entire month if you're only doing a, you know, a one-week update or you know whatever i'm just trying to point out that the strength of the one to the three to four panel strip is usually the fact that it's a really great way to do an arc so something to consider you didn't have the full page this starts heading more into comic book territory the if you're trying to figure out exactly how many panels you want to do on your comic well, you're basically looking at 6, 8, or 12. That is, a 2 by th- 2 columns, 3 rows, or 2 columns, 4 rows, or 3 columns, 4 rows, as the extreme basic of the comic. The advantage is that the fewer the panels you have, the more detail you have. Conversely, the more panels you have per page, the more action you can do. However, the more panels you do, obviously it's also going to take a lot more time. However, don't think that you have to do each panel, if you do say a 6 or 8 or 12 panel page, that you have to have each panel literally on the same page. Whereas that was used to be the case way back when, when we were didn't have computers, well, now you can use image manipulation software such as Photoshop to actually compose those panels and then put those panels into an actual grid. Obviously you're going to have to have some sort of graphics library set up but that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, we're talking your explosions, your rays, your so on and so forth. You're just going to have a little where all these are easily accessible for you. Of course, this isn't a bad idea if you're doing the single panel or even the three to four panel comic. You know, the bigger your graphics library is, the less you actually have to do. So if you start doing those 12 panels, you know, 
a lot of the time you're just basically assembling tools. You're, you're not actually drawing stuff, you're just assembling, you know, them in order to actually accomplish it. If you tend to do a lot of toxic head stuff, this could actually work out in your favor in a lot of ways. So, however, keep in mind that the more panels you have, the more time it's going to take you to actually do a webcomic. So, allow for that. A lot of the full page, for example, usually are only on a setup on a two or three, or sorry, are set up on once or twice a week tops. As opposed to the three to four panel, which is, you know, three to five times a week, or the single gag panel, which is released whenever. And because you are dealing with a web page rather than an actual physical book nine times out of ten, you actually have access to this really cool thing called the Infinite Canvas. In other words, you're not confined to an actual rectangle or a square. You can do a circle. You can actually have a huge... You've got the canvas however big you want to do it on. Something to keep in mind. I mean, obviously, the bigger... I mean, we've just hit a really cool point in computer usage where we can actually accommodate that if you want to do a choo-choo train and actually go through and detail out each individual car and actually do this out as a really long webcomic of some sort, you can do it. It's not going to translate very well to the printed page, but that's fine. You don't have to limit yourself. Um, this also means that if, you know, if you're doing this, you can also do, use animated GIFs as part of your webcomic. A lot of comics that actually use this really cool effect. They can do a panel of, you know, where it's snowing, they can actually have little snowflakes coming in on the thing. So, have some fun with it. Don't feel that you're limited to a actual standard something that you're going to have to be able to print later on. If you don't want to do it that way, if you want to have glowing colors that shift, go for it. You know, there's been a lot of really great web comics to use limited animation. It works really well, and it, you know, just something to consider. At that point, you're doing straight animated gifs, and it's not a bad thing to try. So, but that's all the panels. Just keep in mind, obviously, the more create, the more panels you have, the more time it's going to take. Otherwise, have fun with it and see what you can accomplish. Obviously, when we're looking at each individual panel, each individual panel should be set up on the... Actually, let me take a step back just to play writer for a second. One of the cool things about having it set up as an actual grid, that is, you know where the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to 12, if you're doing so, panels are, is that you can tell the artist that, we're, hey, we're going to be combining these individual grids. Um, and then once we combine these grids, we're renumbering. I do this all the time, and it drives some people crazy, and some people don't really follow. But, what I'm basically looking at is, let's say you've got the six panel, a uh, six panel grid. And you decide you want to try something a little bit interesting. So what you can do is set it up so that it is three rows. At that point, you're finding panels one and two, panels three and four, panels five and six, and creating panels one, two, and three. Yes, yeah, see how simple that was? Or, you can combine panels one and three, and then have the rest of it, you know, numbered regularly. So in other words, you've got this one really big panel right off the bat, and then all the other panels, right, you know, can back that panel up. You know, it helps defining the flow of the page. Or you can just, if you want to, you can have the superhero come in on panel one, the villain come in on panel two. They meet in panel three, which is actually combined three and four, and then. They have their dialogue in the new panels 4 and 5. 
See how much fun you can have when you actually have a grid that you can actually just play off of? So establish your grid, know how many panels you're going to do, and just make sure the writer and the illustrator both know the situation. Obviously communication is key and the better you communicate, the better things are. All right. Keep in mind, by the way, that we're consuming every panel, not the entire page, but each individual panel is set up by the rule of thirds. The rule of thirds really simply is that you divide lengthwise the, into three panels, and then basically you're setting up a tic-tac-toe grid. Take the top pan, take the top edge, divide it evenly into thirds, draw two lines down. Do the same with the um, height. Divide the height into thirds and then draw those two horizontal lines. Don't have to do this literally, as long as you do it reasonably, figuratively. The rule of thirds was set up because, well, it was found that if you put something happening at any one of those two or any of those four dots, that's where all the interest is going to happen. Let's say you're doing a conversation between two people. Well, one person is obviously going to occupy the two dots on the left and the other person will occupy the two dots on the right. It makes a really great little composition. Um, let's say you've got, you know, you've got a person who's outside, outside. You can have the house, possibly trees, take up the two dots on the right. The person will be set up on the bottom left dot, and then you can put the sun with possibly some clouds up on the top left dot. Or, of course, you can reverse that, however you feel comfortable with. I'm just pointing out that 9 times out of 10, it's just a really cool thing to set up your information, your, to use the rule of thirds when it sets up your panels. When it comes down to your word balloons, well, at that point, you're going to have the people, it's really great for because it just simply really organizes your page out really well right off the bat. That is, you've got the people talking, all of a sudden now occupy the bottom two dots, and your word balloons will take up the other two dots. See how great that is? You've got all this really cool organization just by knowing the rule of thirds. And of course you can also put, you know, put any of your major action will happen at those dots. Strictly a side note, if you decide to happen to have stuff that happens in the background, put it dead center. The advantage of this is that, well, it'll get ignored just a little bit, and it'll actually cause people to have to go reread your archives later on. And if you actually do the printed version, they've got something really cool to look forward to. Because let's get real, if people are going to miss stuff, it's going to be right there in the center. So don't make the stuff in the center all that stand out-ish. But, you know, don't be afraid to take advantage of it as well. But the takeaway here is divide each panel in by the rule of thirds and try to focus your balloons on the top two, your people talking on the bottom two, and you should be fine. Just use the dots as that's where the points of interest should be, and you'll be good. It's also a really great, simple way to compose every every panel. Um, keep in mind that you can use any art you want to as a medium. A lot of people default to some variation of pen and ink, or pencils and ink. In essence, you draw out using pencil, then you go over, you know, lines using, to ink them out, and you color them in if necessary. The reason this was set up is because it allows the artist to do all these really... A lot of people tend to do really rough things in their drawings. Um, some beginning artists, for example, will tend to do a lot of circles. It's just a really great way of setting up muscles, body shapes, that sort of thing, is to use a lot of circles. And it's really cool to be able to go through and actually draw those out. Um, other people use guiding lines. You know, 
There's a lot of stuff that when it comes down to the pencils that you won't see in the finished product. Well, the advantage of doing the pencil and ink is that you can go to the pencils, draw over whatever you want to in terms of the ink, and then erase the pencil lines. Um, you're going to find there's a thing called a, a blue pencil that's used specifically in a shade that to basically not be photocopied. These are incredible and they will actually save you a step because at that point what you do is you ink um, the pencils that you want and then you photocopy it and you've eliminated all the penciling. You don't have to erase it. The only problem is, is that as photocopiers have gotten more sophisticated that's not so much the case you actually have to take up you actually have to bump up the contrast a little bit you can still use those non-copier um, blue pencils but just keep in mind you need to bump up the contrast and a few other things in order to get rid of them completely but let's say you're a digital person and you're going to ink digitally that is, you're going to use some sort of image manipulation software in order to do this. Well, at that point, you need to make sure... That, the simplest way to do it is just simply cover the... Um, to create another layer, and then to ink, you know, take over whatever pencil lines you want, and then eliminate the original artwork. It's a no must, you know, no must, no fuss situation. It's really simple and it takes care of the problem. However, there are some debatable advantages to it. If you're doing, a, you know, digital inking, obviously it's going to be a lot easier to control and you've actually saved yourself a step later on. However, a lot of people feel that with the analog version, i.e. the good old freeform, you actually have a fountain pen of some sort, or a other way of inking. I prefer fountain pen, but remember, I'm a writer, not an artist. You have better control over the line control, and if there's something going on weird, generally for some reason it's a lot easier to adapt with to make small changes as needed with a fountain pen than it is to do it digitally. Every, each their own. A fountain pen or some other form of inking Go for it. If you prefer digital inking, go for it. However, keep in mind that either are valid choices and that if some, you find out somebody is using a different method than you are, don't make fun of the person or disrespect them. Yeah, it's just a common courtesy thing or anything else. This is one of those weird situations where you can have different styles and go for it. However, if you're going to use any other medium, like say watercolors is really make some really great web comics as well as oil um just make sure the artwork is clean and easy to read if you tend to get a lot of muddy stuff yeah it's not going to really do well so uh, try to just keep it nice clear clean and you're going to find out it works really well um when it comes to coloring I would obviously suggest that you color by section and do so on by layer. You don't have to have all the blues on the same layer, but you want to have it set up so that whatever you're inking is always going to be on your top layer and you can you know, turn it off and on. What this is going to allow is if you do sm small mistakes... You know, you can easily correct them and you don't have to go through 37 layers in order to do so. What I'm sort of suggesting here is you a uh, really quick way to do it in order to you basically do the colors is to grab all the various areas you're going to ink, uh, color the same way. Go ahead and select those areas. Shift the selection to another layer and color, in that, color it on that layer. You know, you're going to find out real quick that's a really easy way, really quick way to go through and add some flat coloring to the situation. 
if you prefer to throw in a little bit more nuanced color, go for it. I mean, obviously, I'm looking more at the old school so-called four color style that you're going to see in a lot of um, comedy type strips or, you know, what I'm basically looking at is newspaper type stuff. Or even the old school superhero. The reason he actually called it the poor color. So that's just something to consider. Um, make sure you flatten every so often. And you don't have to flatten, you know, the entire thing. Just do it in sections. Like you want to flatten all the blues and all the reds together. Or all the characters, same, you know, with all the same different areas. That sort of thing. If you want to keep it separate, do so. However, keep in mind you definitely want to save every 10 to 15 minutes. Um, the two, big, the two the biggest debate will be what format. Obviously, I'm going to suggest either JPEG or PNG. Um, it's just that most computer programs tend to use those two. Plus, because of the way that the files are saved because there actually is some really cool stuff going on in terms of memory condensing. Um, those are going to be 9 times out of 10 the best two formats to use. Obviously, you can use other formats. Just keep in mind that you're going to have to do a lot of translating or a couple uh, follow-through for another couple of steps. So, try to keep it pings and JPEGs and you should be fine. Balloons. Okay, here's where things are going to get fun. Remember what I was saying about a graphics library earlier? Yeah. When it comes to balloons, you have two different options. You can actually have enclosed areas, or you can just have basic tails, you know, pointing out who's saying what. Both of these are equally valid. So don't, you know, get, don't get too much out of your panties in a bunch over which is the better one. Do whatever one you feel comfortable with. The reason I bring up a graphics library, however, is that you're going to find it really good even if you are using Illustrator, which by the way has a lot of these stuff a lot of this stuff already in it, or at least some, sometimes does. Um the advantage of having this as a graphics library is that you're not going to be constantly redoing them. You know, you can basically go into your graphics library, grab the balloon you're looking for. You know, if you want to do a, a thought cloud, an exciting cloud, or just a regular conversational cloud, just grab the, bu the, bu the balloon you need, copy and paste it onto its own layer, and letter digitally. This isn't, you know, the balloon should not be a major stress issue. Also keep in mind, obviously, when you're doing the artwork that you're going to need to leave room for the balloons. Um, you know, that's sort of why I suggest when you're doing the rule of thirds, keep the balloons to the top two and everything else to the bottom two. You know, as far as those four dots go, you have two dots on top, two dots on bottom. Yeah, balloons should go on the two top, on top and all the rest of the action should happen on the other two. And by the way, Keep in mind that you do want to try to keep about 10 point size. You want to keep something that's going to be able to be easily read. If you tend to have a lot of dialogue that requires bigger balloons, you might want to either debate the size of the panels you're dealing with or combining panels occasionally. If this happens pretty much throughout the entire thing, you might want to have a talk with your writer. All I'm saying is, is that the balloon should fit within the panels you're using. If you're using way too much space in your balloons, yeah, you're going to need to make some changes somewhere. Nine times out of ten, it just means going from a eight or twelve page uh, panel page to a six panel page. You know, you are perfectly allowable to change the number of panels per page. You don't have to have every panel be the exact same 12-panel grid. And again, don't be afraid to slap your writer. 
yeah, I appreciate occasionally you'll get into this really cool Shakespearean stunt and just you just you want to go and do all these really cool Shakespearean things and jokes on us and yeah, and then some you just use the art illustrator and need to rein in your writer occasionally. Um Captions. You're basically going to have a lot of different types of captions running around. They're going to come down to two different types of captions. We're either looking at the important captions and we're looking at the not so important captions. Important captions are the ones that tell you where the time and place are. They do the meanwhiles. You know, they establish the continuity. They're important because well, you need that information in order to properly digest what's going on. These obviously are going to have to be brief, quick, and extremely to the point. You know, Sonoma Desert, December 1812. That's it. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Just a few days later, you get any idea here? We're talking, they're extremely basic, they're extremely necessary, but keep them, you know, if they get too ridiculous, somebody needs to be slapped around. Um, these ones need to go somewhere near the top. They need to be prominent. And, hey, let's go back to the rule of thirds, right? These should be above the top two dots. If you're also going to have people talking, well, those balloons go to the top two dots. Your captions will obviously go above that, and your people talking will be on the bottom two dots, just like they normally do. However, let's talk about the ones at the bottom for a sec, because these are also important as well, but not as important. These will do the old comic book style back in, you know, uh, refer back to this uh, page or you know they'll basically give the fun trivial stuff about that you need to keep in mind when you're dealing with the situation but again you don't want them to be too big if it hits a point that these panels take over a third of the panel it's time to have a serious conversation with the writer now you'll also have free floating captions. A lot of superhero comics right now are doing the dreaded we're going to introduce our, you know, we're going to attach a caption to every hero that gives a real brief rundown of either who this person is, you know, basically who this person is, what the person can do. That's cool especially if you've got a team with a hundred different characters. If you only have a couple of characters and the same ones that have been through the, since the basic beginning of this comic, you don't have to do that. I mean, obviously we're looking at Avengers, X-Men, Justice League of America, you know, those teams that have an established history that goes back decades and they have 100 plus characters. Those captions, those free-floating captions are really great for keeping track of who's who. But again, if you've only got a relatively couple, you know, you've got maybe a total of a dozen characters and the reader should be familiar with these guys, don't worry about it. Uh, the other caption will be, I hate using the term, we're going to call them thought captions. If you have a question I'm talking about, one word, Deadpool. These are those captions that where the person has an inner dialogue that's going on that doesn't quite fit into the concept of a thought balloon. You know, it's something that's not necessarily an inner dialogue, but it's something that needs to be noted anyway. You see a lot of these captions, especially, and not just because of Deadpool. I mean, obviously, the concept existed way before Deadpool. Um... The best example I can think of off the top of my head is Rorschach from Watchmen. 
you know, obviously the tradition goes all the way back to Sam Spade, strangely enough, which is not a comic. But you get the idea. You, these, even though there's thought balloons, there's can be placed wherever you need to put them. Just make sure that they're colored ident to identify the person who's actually using them. Um, these are also great for continuing on dialogue where you don't have the two characters on scene. And by on scene, I mean they are not even there. You know? Some bizarre reason you've decided to carry on a conversation from the kitchen. You know, following a little... A kid or a gerbil or whatever. You know, not one of the characters involved in the conversation. But the conversation nonetheless follows the kid or the gerbil anyway. To so go through and establish colors for the two characters or some sort of captioning style if you're doing black and white or, you know, some variation thereof. Whatever you're comfortable with. Just make sure that the two captions are somehow identifiable back to the people that are talking in them. That should pretty much cover you with captions and thought balloons. At least in theory. Alright. So now we've gotten all that fun out of the way. Let's talk software. Here's the deal. It doesn't matter what software you use. Yeah, you've got all this really cool stuff that's set up specifically for comics. Um... A lot of manga, manga companies have actually set up their individual little software. And you obviously, if you can find some of that software, go for it. However, you can get away with using a really cheap um, image manipulation software. Uh, if you really need to, look up GIMP over at, I believe, SoundForge. It's a free version of Photoshop. It works, it's highly effective. It doesn't really take all that much getting used to. When it comes down to it, all you want to be able to do is employ layers, some sort of importing feature, and be able to scan. Because let's get real, any I know a lot of people tend to you know, use do nothing but computers, but there's a lot of advantages to being able to scan in artwork. So, you know, just as long as you have layers and you can scan, you should be good to go. Um, you're going to want to use about at least 300 dots per inch, the 300 DPI. Just basically, it's going to look really great when you actually, I mean, obviously, if you're doing nothing but web comics, you can get away with just using a 72 DPI. That's cool. But if you want to actually be able to print the stuff out at some point, and let's get real, the 72 DPI was used back in a situation where, you know, it took a while to load a decent sized image. You hear all the jokes about the 12, you know, the teenagers, yeah, let's go with that, teenagers downloading pornographic images and it taking a couple of hours. Yeah, we don't do that nowadays. If it takes us a couple of hours, it means there's somebody throttling the bandwidth somewhere along the line and being a total jerk. Okay? You can get away with putting a lot of memory onto your images. Um, I'm just pointing out that you want to keep it nice and simple to load. And about 72 DPI for a straight digital image is not a bad thing. Most people won't notice it. However... If you're trying to do this for print purposes, yeah, you're going to want a lot more memory. And you want to, the dots per image is essentially the dots per inch is literally how many small little dots of color there are per inch. The more of them you have, the more detail it is, and the more flowing the color of what looks. Um, if you really want a really nice example and you don't mind going old school, compare some of the Mobius comics to the superhero comics of the 80s. You know? All I'm saying is when you print the stuff out, you're going to want it at least 300 DPI. Um, 
other than that, any any digital sorry any image manipulation software can be used. Um, I know a lot of web comics that are done nothing but paint, and they look and they still look pretty good. It requires a lot more care and a lot more attention to detail to pull it off, but you know, even something as simple as paint can be used. A lot of people like Photoshop just because, well, it's the way you can translate a lot of files quickly. Um, a lot of people also use Phil Illustrator. Perfectly valid choice. I mean, not just a perfectly valid choice, actually an excellent, excellent option. Because Illustrator is specifically set up in order to do um, commercial graphics. So, if you, get a, if you can master Illustrator... Dude, seriously, more power to you. I don't mean that in a general derogative sense. I mean it actually, you'll love what Illustrator will do for you. Right after that, you know, Photoshop. If, again, if you're serious about putting this into some sort of comic book later on, you're going to want something that will allow you to create PDFs and do so quickly. Um, PageMaker is my personal default. A lot of other people use uh, Microsoft Publisher. I just like PageMaker because it gives you a lot of really cool options in terms of keeping everything straight. Um, it also allows you to really quickly make some, you know, simplify doing your um, PDF files, which you're going to need when you start printing stuff out. So obviously, you know, work out some way where you can do a a PDF file quickly and easily. I mean, I'm sure you can probably, by now you, actually, I know you can do it using Word. You just want, you know, if you have to use Word, so be it. But I think you'll prefer using PageMaker. But, again, everybody has different styles and it's next to impossible to allow for it all. Just figure out what your, what your printer wants and pay attention to your printer. Which means also that if you are going to be doing this, um, think in terms of four pages at a time. Or something that's divisible by four. If you are going to be doing this as a comic, there's only going to be two formats you're going to want to put it in. And that's the floppy, which is of course the glossy cover, pages in the middle, and what they call saddle stitch, or stapled. It's cheap, and it's not necessarily it's not really a bad format to play around with. On the other hand, if you have a lot thicker book, say more than 50, 60 pages, yeah, you're going to be going trade paperback route. Either way, a lot of old school printers tend to think in terms of four. You know. The old comic books used to be 22 pages, which is obviously not divisible by four, but that's because they'd also put in uh, two to six pages of, of advertisements, and therefore go from 22 to 24 or 28. Notice how 24 and 28 are divisible by four. Trade paperbacks. There are no real guidelines as far as the pages go, but I sort of suggest that if you're doing more than, say, 36 to 48 pages that you just simply say screw it and go to the trade paperback route. It's not really hard to print out in those and a lot of people actually default to those. So, you know. Um, other tips. Try to, before you actually go into mass production of your comics, Make sure you get what's called a galley proof. This will usually take one of two forms. It'll either be a... The old school version is that it used to be an actual negative, and you'd have to judge from that. However, a lot of printers will actually give you a actual printed version of your um, comic. If you're working with a uh, print-on-demand, such as um, Kablam or Lulu, Two sites I heavily recommend you use, by the way. Um, 
make sure you print off a copy for your own personal use before you actually let everybody else know about this. This way you can actually go through, correct any problems, and yeah, generally speaking, there's going to be at least one or two minor problems. Sometimes it will end up being a major problem. Uh, you know, something as stupid as... You know, you screwed up on the coloring and the character who should be Periwinkle is coming off as pink. You know. Just make sure you've got a proof copy before you actually let everybody else know about, you know, that the comic's available. The reason, by the way, I'm suggesting Kablammer with Lulu is because both of these are, both pr they call print on demand. What this means is that anytime somebody wants a copy of the comic, they go to these sites, order a comic, and then it is printed on demand for them and shipped specifically to them. In other words, you don't have to have a couple thousand comics printed up and ready to go. If you want to do that, time to go after a Kickstarter. You know? And you get to deal with all that rigmarole. Or if you want, you know, some sort of crowdsourcer. You don't necessarily have to go with Kickstarter. You know, that is pretty much the default. If you're going to go, you want convention copies? Again, Kickstarter or some, some other crowdsourcer. Otherwise, if you just want to sell your comic and have people enjoy it, hey, Kablam and Lulu are both a pretty great ways to go. Um, the other cool thing is you can actually offer a digital version. That, and if you are going to offer a pr digital version, seriously, don't put it at the same price as the print version. A 99 cent digital version for a $5 printed version is perfectly legit. You don't have to worry about all the printed paper. You don't have to worry about a lot of stuff when it comes to the digital version. You know, the person you're sending to obviously shouldn't have to deal with all that, you know, shouldn't have to pay for printing if you're not actually printing. You know what I mean? Just something to consider to be nice. Um, another option, obviously, is Amazon. Because they actually do have their, because it was obviously originally set off as a bookseller. And you can actually, they have a lot of great ways to sell books on Amazon. Both printed and digital. So again, definitely a service worth taking advantage of. So, yeah, you can go eBay if you really want to. You probably don't really want to. So, today's lesson. One, get a copy of Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics. This is something I cannot... I just can't emphasize enough. Just do it. Uh, make sure that you're setting up a printer when you actually do the... Um, when you're... Ah, sorry. When you're actually doing your comic, try to set it up for the printer ahead of time. This means you won't have to go through and remaster things, so to speak. You only have to do it once. It's good to go. And, you know, it's a simple way of doing it. Decide on ahead of time if you're going to go to a crowdsourcer or if you want to go print on demand. I, everybody has their own choice on this. Everybody, there's a thousand and one pluses and minuses either way. Work it out for yourself. I'm not trying to be a jerk here. It's just that some people like going Kickstarter even if they are essentially just doing a straight, some version of a print on demand. Um... It's just an easy way to gauge pre-orders, you know, which is not which is actually a pretty good thing. Print on demand, you just let it go, you market the heck out of that link, and you hope people just buy your comic. And again, if you're trying to go for conventions, crowdsourcing definitely has its advantages here. So either way you go about it, you know. You're going to have to figure out the best way to do the art yourself. And like I said, figure out some sort of shorthand between you and your writer. 
And yeah, that is something you need to keep in mind is that the illustrator is the person who rings in the writer occasionally. That's just part of the relationship. So, I hope this helps. Talk to you later.